So despite all the issues faced by the European Union, it continues to be one of the most successful experiments in transnational governance. And because of that, some have suggested the EU should serve as a model for a future world government. Others go a step further and suggest that nations outside of Europe should be allowed to join the EU until it grows into a world government. However, <laughs> is the European Union, Union a model that we should be striving for? Is it truly representative? So here to answer and guide us through this is Dr. Wolfgang Pape, who served in the European Commission for 30 years. He's a lawyer and author living in Belgium and will present on the European Union global governance with this concept of omnilateralism, which I'm really excited to hear about. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we really appreciate your willingness to dive into these important topics. So I will go ahead and share my screen with your presentation and we can begin. So let me get in uh, presenter mode. Okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed, and good morning to you in Washington, wherever in the USA. Uh, I'm talking from Brussels. My name is Wolfgang Pape, as mentioned, and I'm very much from the bottom of my heart a European. That does not mean that I defend everything, and particularly not the EU as a model, as it was just proposed. I see too much uh, to criticize in the EU to call it a model for anybody. I think we all should learn from our mistakes here in Europe, and mistakes have gone through history. And that's what I want to start with, with the history, because I know that the US Americans start very often with a, can you go to the next slide already? With a joke, but I'm very bad to present a joke here. So I, I'm not Japanese either. I don't apologize for my language limits and my very heavy accent I still have with me, but nevertheless, I try to explain Europe from the bottom of the history. And here we have in European history throughout conflicts, which were wars between nations. Over several <laughs> centuries, we know that we have been fighting each other between the nations since the Westphalian system. It was a piece of Westphalia in 1648, which should bring peace, but nevertheless, it started for wars over borders, and these wars were made with weapons of steel and disastrous energy. And that not only in Europe, as you see here with this picture I include, which is Hiroshima in Japan, where the Americans landed to take over sooner or later than afterwards, the other mm -hmm. islands of Japan. This idea of having steel and energy to go into war is very basic over the last centuries, and it continues, as we say, even in Ukraine nowadays. So this is an essential factor in war making, having the steel and the energy. Next, please. That brought our so-called founding fathers of the European Union to the European coal and steel community as a starting point to make sure that there is no more war within this European integration process. As Robert Schumann at the time declared in 1950, la solidarité manifestera que toute guerre devient impossible. Even in English, I think it's clear that the solidarity is important and makes guerre impossible. This solidarity is expressed in the integration process of the European Union as we have it now, and it brought us to the point of becoming the Peace Nobel Prize laureate in 2012, when even Obama later on recognized the EU in his one of his last speeches as one of the greatest political and economic achievements of modern times. Next, please. But let's see, and since Trey already mentioned the difficulty of some of the political rights within the EU, what are the conditions for new members to go, come into the EU integration process, the so-called Copenhagen criteria. And I have to emphasize, this is quite different from other integration process, like in Asia, the ASEAN or the African Union, Mercosur in Latin America, 
and in particular NAFTA in North America, these integration processes are very much what we call intergovernmental. But in the EU case, it is not only intergovernmental, as we say later, see later, we are supranational. And that means we have as a basic requirement, for instance, democracy for stable institutions. We have a society based on rule of law. All the member states have to respect human rights. And there has to be respect as well at the protection of minority groups, which is very relevant here in Europe in particular, in context with the so-called minorities of Roman or gypsies, as they often are called. This is different from minority groups as they are seen in the United States, for instance. And another aspect, which of course is very much in the economic sphere, is <laughs> there have to be a market economy able to compete in the what we call single market that is already the integration of the various national markets into one market. And the most uh, important in the end, uh, acceptance of EU objectives and existing legislation is an enormous factor. And here, for instance, Turkey has enormous problems still to bring in all these rules which we have already established on the so-called motto of Aki Communitaire. That means everything that has <laughs> been achieved in terms of legislation, in terms of rules and standards within the EU. Next slide, please. So what is European integration about? We have to see the original driving force now more than 70 years rather successfully, there is peace, peace in the territory of the European Union. And this is most important because that was a starting point, the original driving force for the integration process in Europe. And we being European continental law tradition based, have this idea of having rules and institutions as a basis of this kind of integration process. I have a couple of examples here, for instance, the so-called GDPR, that is the uh, private, uh, the uh, digital privacy regulation, which is becoming more and more a global uh, rule because it has an enormous impact. And there are other pieces of legislation where some people even think the moment the ink hits the paper in Europe, it becomes a global piece of legislation. This, of course, is going pretty far. I wouldn't go that far, but it's the New York Times, nevertheless, that already in 2004 brought out this slogan. And we see de facto that the EU rules are steadily emerging as the international standard, which was very important, for instance, in the beginning when the you know, mobile phones were going over the borders of national borders and became international standards. This was enormous chance for European enterprises, European uh, at the time high-tech uh, multinational enterprises to go into other export markets, particularly at the time this was Nokia from uh, Finland going worldwide and even into China, which has changed of course with new developments. But this idea is very much based on the possibilities of pooling political sovereignty. So far, we had always the absolute sovereignty at national level. This is now relativized with the example of the European integration. We call that pooling of sovereignty. That means certain rights are given to the level of the EU, to the European regional level, not anymore at the national level. And that's very important. And here we ha often have various kinds of majority votes, very often even consensus building to reach some kind of common denominator where we can go on and have legislation put out which is valid throughout the union. This brings more and more now, particularly under the new geopolitical context, the idea of EU strategic aut autonomy. Autonomy has to be seen as less than sovereignty. Sovereignty goes back to the sovereign rights of a monarch, whereas autonomy means just being based on its own uh, ideas, on its own independence in so far politically. And we have seen with the environment of Donald Trump in the USA, with Brexit, with the war of Russia and Ukraine, that Europe has to be more autonomous 
on its own, finding its own interest defended worldwide. And this is very important in the future because we see the need for Europe to be its own uh, driver of its own interests worldwide. One more factor which I have to make very clear here is particular with an American audience that we in Europe are very proud of the diversity of our different cultures, even within this very small territory of Europe. Because here we see not only 24 languages being practiced within the EU, which is very complicated and creates enormous bureaucracy sometimes, but this as well is the basis of our crea creativity, because we feel that only with differences in different cultures, we can create something new. We have to be sometimes complementary, but nevertheless, finding then a common integration process to bring it all together. That's exactly what we want and where we go into the future. It's different a little bit from the American approach, which is often called a melting pot. We don't want this kind of melting pot. Next slide, please. Let's see a little bit how this is being uh, done in practice. The decision-making process, particularly in the council, just to give you a rough idea, there's a council, which is kind of a, yeah, you could say a Senate in American terms. And there is the European Parliament, the EP, which is directly elected from the citizens of the EU. And then there's a commission, which is kind of the administration, the governance, if you want so, the executive uh, body of the three uh, different powers of governance, as Montesquieu would say. Here in the council where the member states are represented, usually at level of ministers or even lower level of ambassadors sometimes, which is almost daily, these meetings of ambassadors actually. But at the highest level, you have, of course, the heads of state and heads of governments coming together in the council. We see in this council of member states that the decisions are done 80% by consensus. And I think this is very interesting to see. That means you don't have a minority saying in the end, no, we don't go along with this decision. Very often, 80% of the cases, there is consensus. Of course, before the consensus, there are very often what we call marathon sessions in, in the council building here in Brussels. And we have lots of uh, yeah, give and take, uh, dealing and wheeling in order to get this consensus. But once this consensus stands, it's important that all the member states go along with it. All the governments of the individual uh, member states are behind it. And this, I think, is very important to see as well as an example for global governance, because we cannot go into global governance with just majority voting. This would uh, never really go anywhere, as we see in the Security Council and even in the General Assembly of the UN at the moment. Then we have another means for the 20% non-consensus, where we have so-called qualified majority voting, which is somewhat different in the sense of uh, we have certain criteria for these uh, majorities. You have to be 55% of all 27 member states being uh, in the majority here. And then you have to have with this majority as well, 65% of individual EU citizens. That means small member states together are not enough. You need sometimes big member states, big in the sense of high populations to go along. And this creates some kind of, uh, yeah, dare I say again, consensus building very often because the difficulty to find this kind of majority is very obvious. Next slide, please. I mentioned in the beginning the importance of pooling the sovereignty for the competences of the EU. And here we have different levels of competence. The exclusive competence of the EU, that means member states have nothing to say in this area of competence. It's very obvious here, the customs union, that means vis-a-vis -vis the outside, customs tariffs, anti-dumping procedures, for instance, the representation in the WTO, the World Trade Organization. This is done only by the EU. Even somebody like uh, President uh, Macron or Chancellor Schultz, they cannot go there and represent their country individually. They have to first find 
a common denominator at EU level, and then the EU, most cases, the Commission represents the uh, EU in this body, like the WTO and other trade organizations. This, of course, is based on the common commercial policy. That means commercial issues, even within the EU, are very much ruled by the EU, by the European level. And of course, with third countries like Japan, uh, the USA, South Korea, and others, China, the international trade agreements, very often free trade agreements, are very much in the exclusive competence of the European level. Inside the EU, which has quite an impact actually, even with uh, big companies, the high tech companies like Google, is competition law. Here as well, we have the exclusive competence. And these are very important nowadays because these high tech companies have enormous impact as well on the information society. We see more and more worldwide through the internet having impacts which are not always positive. And here we feel that competition policy actually should be beyond only the nation state in order to be able to have some kind of balance and avoid to have giants taking over the information system for the world. One of the cases here I mentioned is, for instance, that Google was fined more than 4 billion euro because it was kind of using its dominant position in order to uh, avoid other new starters and others to come into that market of the uh, software for the mobile phones. And then another so-called exclusive competence is with the monetary policy of the Eurozone. The Euro as such is not yet valid in all member states. Only very recently, for instance, Croatia on the first of this month joined the Eurozone, but this Within the Eurozone, these member states who are in this Eurozone, they are as well under this exclusive competence of the EU. On terms, in terms of Euro, the uh, member states have no say anymore whatsoever. And then one other policy here is a fishery policy where the EU has as well this kind of dominant and even exclusive competence. Next slide, please. The next level of competence for the EU is the shared competence with member states. That means member states in the EU, both sides have competences uh, being shared here. That means certain parts are done by member states, other parts in this, uh, for instance, the internal market are up to the member states individually. The so-called free for freedoms obviously have an impact uh, where the member states have to do some on their own rulings some standards as well. This is very much focusing on economic, social, and territorial cohesion, for instance. There, the EU tries to bring some kind of equality in different parts and if, even regions of individual member states. Agriculture is another uh, example of shared competence, as is environment and consumer protection policy. Transport, energy, the outer space, the area of freedom, security, and justice, all these uh, sectors of governance are shared with member states and the EU. Public health, of course, now with COVID and corona problems, has been very much as a shared competence, but we have seen de facto, and I give the example a little bit closer later on, uh, these safety concerns are enormously uh, growing now, and there the EU has done de facto enormous contributions, for instance, that we don't have competition over the access to different uh, vaccination uh, products and so on. And this is seen as de facto increasing in terms of shared competence for the EU. ODA, the Official Development Aid, and humanitarian aid are other examples of shared EU and member state competence. More difficult is the issue of foreign security and de defense policies. There, of course, is a very core of national sovereignty for many uh, member states. And here we have to do a lot of discussion to find a common denominator. Nevertheless, the EU as such has now more than 120 uh, different embassies worldwide in different third countries, as we call them, 
and I myself have had this experience in Washington as well as in Tokyo, where sometimes the EU delegation or the EU embassy has enormous impact because most of the issues with some trading partners are in the economic sphere where the EU has uh, very clearly, uh, yeah, I dare say, the exclusive competence again. So these different shared competences are always in cooperation with member states. Next slide, please. And the least uh, effective influence of the EU is in the so-called supporting comp competences. This is particularly the case for small and medium enterprises, where the chambers of commerce in the different member states are quite diverse. The organizations are quite different. For instance, Germany, you still have the obligation to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce locally in order to uh, you have an influence on the policy, whereas in other member states, it's much more liberal. So this is a case even more so with culture. The cultural issues are very much, dare I say, even regional, not national. I'm living here in Brussels, where we have officially in the capital two languages. We have all over the country, Belgium, three languages officially recognized. So it's very difficult for the EU as such to have some kind of one policy for all cultural issues in the member states. So languages and culture together with education are very much only supporting issues and supporting very often de facto, and this is very much my personal experience, means that the EU can come in with money and with money, they can do a lot on their own at EU level. One example is a so-called Erasmus Plus, the scholarship for students and young people going abroad within the EU and even to third countries supported by the scholarships at European level. And this is enormous impact on the next generation to become European and identify with the European integration. Of course, it's more difficult for issues like sport. We still have, like most recently, the national teams of uh, football or soccer, as you say, in the US, where there is, of course, competition in between, but you even have competition within the uh, UK of Great Britain. So the idea of the nation is very delicate uh, for sports here to bring in. But this is very much left to the individual member state and as well as the civil protection, disaster prevention, all that, which recently, unfortunately, has become more important again because of climate change and issues we see here already in this context. Uh, the civil protection is very much at national level of member states. Next slide, please. If you look into the de facto decision making and decision shaping of the EU, it's a rather complicated system. I should just point out, as I mentioned before already, at the right side here of the slide, the three institutions of the Commission, COM, the Council, and the EP, they work together in what we call co-decision. And this is the final decision making. But before that, you have various groups of experts NGOs, civil society, having influences through what we call the ECOSOC, that's the Economic and Social Committee, which is somewhat similar to the institution, but much more uh, organized than at the uh, global level of the UN. And then we have, and this is quite interesting as well, the Committee of the Regions, the C of R below here, where the regions within different member states are represented again, directly at European level. These two are consultative bodies. They don't, they are not really part of the decision making, but they are part of the decision shaping, as I call it here. This uh, scheme I have drawn up here is very much my personal interpretation. So don't take that as any official decision making uh, uh, institutional setup. It's very much my personal experience and my personal uh, view of things as I stand. Very much uh, in the European spirit is this idea of comitology. It's a very right in, uh, in red letters there. This is the idea that at the very end of the implementation of legislation, the EU Commission as such has a very strong influence in these various committees. That's why they call it comitology 
in the committees together with experts from member states, that is official experts from member states together with the technocrats of the commission work out the way how to implement the various legislative proposals, which then finally are hitting the market or even the individual in uh, his or hers rights and obligations. So this setup of uh, decision making and decision shaping for my personal understanding is very much the way the EU really works in, uh, in reality. Next slide, please. So the final decisions, that means the legislation that comes out, are drawn up first by the Commission with a proposal, and then they go through the European Parliament and the Council for various reviews. And they can put in new uh, changes, they can put in whatever lobby business and other civil society influences there are for amendments. And I have to say here, very important here at the European level is the so-called lobby register. This is often compared to the uh, influence of the lobby in Washington, which seems to be much more, dare I say, uh, yeah, uh, money oriented than here. And we saw that recently when we put up new ideas about what we call the Digital Market Act and the Digital Service Act, how the big international, multinational companies try to influence the European legislative process, it was very difficult for them to do because they are used that with a lot of money you can change things, which is not always the case here because there is to a certain degree uh, uh, transparency through this lobby register. And I have to admit just recently the scandals in the parliament here where the uh, third country, as we call it, of Qatar had enormous influence on some of the decisions in parliament is outside the commission. That means in parliament, there was this danger and they didn't have much of a lobby register that could give enough uh, transparency to the influence of third parties here. But once the EP and the council find some kind of co-decision, co bringing together uh, their opinions and then with qualified majority or sometimes even uh, they have to wait for uh, long deliberations, like for instance about Hungary, which was mentioned already as a difficult case here, because Prime Minister Orban calls his own government, a government illib illiberal, and there are lots of issues with human rights and even the independence of the judiciary. These funds, which were supposed to be uh, set aside for Hungary, were put on a, a kind of a waiting list because we wanted to make sure that Hungary tries to follow up with their obligations under the treaties for human rights and the basic democratic rights here. But uh, this apparently now seems to be going into a smoother way and Hungary seems to be coming into the main line again to a certain degree as Poland did very much already beforehand because they are changing their system which was beforehand not really independent in terms of judiciary. And now apparently they are moving more into this more democratic understanding of the rule of law with the independence of the judiciary. So there are movements now which are in a positive direction. But on the other hand, I have to say as well, because of the uh, war in Ukraine, there are still basic differences with Hungary in particular. So this, once this co-decision is reached by parliament and the council, then we have a legal uh, rule made up, the legislation, and uh, finally it will be before the court if there are some issues with the legislation. It happens as well that the council and parliament block the proposal by the commission, but this is rather rare. And I mentioned already uh, the commission has enormous influence in the end on this implementation of the laws because this comitology, as we call it here in, in Brussels, uh, shows very often that the regulation or the directive, these are the two means of legislation in the European context, with its uh, supranationality, have very much the European spirit behind it. And that's supposed to be represented in particular by the Commission, but very often even the European Parliament is more 
European minded, if I dare say so, than the Commission. Just to clear up this uh, terminology here, regulation means something as a law at European level has direct legislative inflect, uh, input and uh, validity in member states, whereas a directive is only some kind of a framework where the national administration and national legislation even has to follow up to work out some kind of national solution within this framework given by the directive of the European Union. Next slide, please. Yeah, maybe we can have a pause here for questions now because we are moving now beyond the EU. If there are questions, comments, critique coming up, I am very open to learn from you with your different aspects from well, the European I I have a few questions and I'll I'll just start quickly as far as you know I watched in Europe last summer with just historic flooding and then also um the heat waves that were just mm -hmm. uh that killed so many people across so many uh European countries and the EU is supposed to be this response to alleviate that and, and to be there. Like how effective really was that last summer um, in, in dealing with the climate crisis that we're faced with? Uh, the climate crisis as such is much more in the competence of the EU than the disaster follow-up. I mentioned already okay. in the various competences here, disasters come under uh, the uh, yes, all these aid systems come under the shared competence, whereas the overall policy on climate change is very much done by, uh, at the EU level. It's a shared competence, uh, and the disasters are done in what we call a supporting policies. So when you talk about, for instance, the COP process, COP 26, 7, and so on, here the EU is representing the member states all together. We have usually our commissioner, it was uh, Mr. Timmerman recently in uh, Egypt, for instance, for COP27. And uh, we have uh, at national level very much the uh, policies and the uh, dealing with the disasters on the spot. And even within Germany, for instance, you have uh, sometimes the sub-national lender the kind of state within Germany dealing with these issues or even local competence of different uh, mayors in the small villages as well. So the competences here are multi-level governance, at different levels, different competences. At the climate issue, there is very much the EU involved. But if you go into disasters, particular cases, like for instance, flooding you had recently, or even if there's a disaster because of, uh, yeah, trying out of uh, certain plants or whatever, that would be much more at the uh, competence of the nations, member states, or even local issues. Very complicated. Yeah, Mary? sorry. I have a question. Uh, where Where is the, along that line, where is the um, EU formally on the, on the regulation of coal? What is the current uh, status of what is adopted rule or law in the EU relative to regulation on coal? Uh, here the EU again can do very little because this is very much member states issues. You might know that for instance Germany changed very drastically against nuclear after Fukushima. Yes. It was a decision very personally apparently even by Angela Merkel at the time. There the EU tries to bring member states to, together to coordinate and it's interesting, for instance, we have now a network over borders, network of energy over mm -hmm. borders. For instance, if there's a problem of energy supply in Germany, we would get energy from France. And France is still very much focusing on nuclear energy. That means some of the German Greens, for instance, don't like that even. And they prefer, in that case, to connect with Poland. And Poland and Germany have already it's net connected. So there are connections de facto already. There's an enormous 
amount of exchange. It has to do as well with different climate issues. For instance, in the north, you have much more renewables with wind, whereas in Spain, for instance, you have all the solar possibilities for renewable energy. So uh -huh. there are networks of exchanges. But policy-wise, this is very much still at um, national, at member state level. Got it. And is the same that would be, that be the same in relative to uh, the uh, pandemic? Uh, there as well, yeah. But de facto, and that I will show that in a minute, we have seen enormous influence by the EU. Uh, the Commission was buying the vaccines mm -hmm. to get some kind of big deal, and then was kind of allocating different patches of the vaccines to member states in order to avoid that member states would be competing with different prices, like in an auction, to get uh, as much as possible for their own uh, pop population. Right. So here again, de facto, the EU was quite influential, although in terms of legal background, this was a little bit controversial, but it was successful. That's why nobody really brought it to a high political level, or there were some uh, concerns and uh, uh, von der Leyen, the president of the commission was criticized of being too fast in getting into the deal there. But this is at political level. Okay, thank you. Matt? Uh, yeah, um, are there examples where a member state deviates from uh, one or more of the competencies? And, and if so, if there are examples, how is that resolved? How is that dealt with? Once we have established the rules, we have different kinds of, of course, the various treaties as such have some kind of constitutional level of rule. Then you have the normal legislation, as I mentioned already, there are regulations and directives. If, for instance, one example, which is quite obvious, the German uh, government in Berlin subsidizes Volkswagen and gives them a certain advantage in the single market of the EU over other companies like Fiat, Renault, right. what have you, then the EU commission first sends out a letter, a kind of a warning. If there's no change in the German attitude and the German practice, then this case goes to court, the court in Luxembourg, as we say, that's the EU Court of Justice. And there, there was a clear case, for instance, with this uh, issue of Volkswagen, which was done a couple of years ago only, that this would uh, violate the basic principles of the common market, because there shouldn't be any privilege at national level over other companies in the single market. In that case, Volkswagen would have been privileged over the other companies. And the court clearly says this is illegal and Germany had to stop it and it stopped. It had an impact. So there's a clear case that the court has a final word in that case of okay. different opinions, how to interpret the law, for instance. And then, oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I'll, I have a follow-up well, One other quick that. question. Um, uh, the union is not considered a federation as some countries are called a federation. What are the distinctions between, what is it that, that makes it not a federation? What are the distinctions between the EU and say the United States, which is considered a federation or Canada or whatever? We have our own federation. Germany, for instance, is a federal, right. it has a federal system. Correct. And you have to be more clear here. There are federal systems and there are confederations as well. You know, from your American history, there was a confederation in the beginning before you federalized the system. And we have, for instance, here in Belgium, still discussions going back to some kind of confederation because they have their language differences, their cultural difference between Wallonia and Flanders, for instance. These issues are under discussion, but the EU as such has only certain rights which are exclusive, as I mentioned already, which we call supranational. So it's not yet a federal thing where the through-going competences are from the very low local level all to the EU level. There are still certain, what they call even sovereignty rights at national level. And this has to be uh, considered as being non-federal. If there were, would be 
a clear through going, uh, yeah, through going, yeah, should I call it a federation system in the sense of getting competences at each level higher. Right. And to post even at global level, you know, the world federation, uh, world federalists, as they call themselves, so they are very active with this model of having a world a parliament and world government. This would be very difficult. And at the EU level, we are not that far yet. That's true. Right. And I know, for instance, in the UK, they use the word federal as some kind of dirty word. And <laughs> it's used in Brexit discussions, even as being the, the menace from Brussels, the federal uh, system and things like that. So we are not at that state yet. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And ultimately, wouldn't you say that that the distinction becomes down to who has the monopoly on force? Uh, the 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 European unions, all all of the nations have their own defense systems. There's no integrated, uh, there's no integrated military. Uh, I, I should say control. in German. I should say "jein" in German. Yes and no, because they are already <laughs> now, particular in the. In view of the war in Ukraine, there are 4,000 soldiers under some kind of EU command, a rapid uh -huh. force that is brought together. And there are more and more uh, cooperation at military level. But you're right, there is no command at the European level. What is more important, particularly from my per personal uh, understanding, is to have a common procurement system for the military. military. Because there's still this issue, even within NATO, it's enormous waste having different weapon systems within NATO. But right. even within Europe, we still have this problem. It's not only a matter of communication here between different languages, different cultures, and so on. But the it's military. It's not only waste, yeah, but it also that the enormous. ammunition doesn't fit each other's weapon. Yes, and that's one of the problems, even giving weapons to Ukraine, as you might know. Yeah. This issue is within the EU as well, an issue still. But we are particularly now again, because of Ukraine, moving into this kind of rapid uh, intervention force to have some kind of basic common denominator here in case there is a need for moving uh, troops. And we have uh, some kind of police force already in one way or the other, even in third countries. You might have heard of uh, various actions of the EU together with the United Nations uh, blue helmets in Africa, we use them only in the sense of police forces. That means they are not using, uh, other than in self-defense, their weapons mm -hmm. to uh, to intervene. They use other means if possible. But uh, this is very much under discussion and there are different angles still. It's very political in the uh, impact and particularly yeah, France is very much in favor of this development versus Germany because of its history, as you might know again, in the context of Ukraine is rather hesitant to go there and they have this basic uh, historic uh, hesitance of uh, mm -hmm. using arms in general. I hope I, to a certain degree, answered your question at least. Oh, certainly, yes, thank you. Thank you. And then I just have kind of a, like one final broad question as far as like, you know, the EU's one of these goals is to bring equality to all of the different EU states, but I actually don't see that when I look at the European Union. I still see these huge differences between, you know, really poor areas. Um, I mean, even in, in Brussels, um, there is so many, you know, when you're looking at Belgium, there's so many different regions and you're still, I mean, there's groups that are talking about seceding from, from Belgium, like we don't need the South, we don't. <laughs> um, so how really, like, how would you classify the effectiveness of, of that main goal to bring, to bring equality to all of these different member states? Uh, no, I like the way you use the word equality. I, I have a little problem with that. Even I, say uh, very often in French, uh, vive la différence. And for me, I mentioned it in the beginning, diversity, not only of languages, of cultures, are very creative. That's my experience I had living in Japan, living in the US and being in Europe now. 
that uh, this diversity can help enormously to be productive and get new ideas out of the differences. And equality as such, even between sexes, dare I say, does not bring us any further. I've, I'm fully behind the individual rights to have equal rights with men, women, whatever. But the equality, I don't want to homogenize cultures or homogenize even countries. It's obvious we have different size of countries. We have different cultural backgrounds, different histories. And all these differences, bringing them together in a consensus, if possible, to find a common rule. I think this is enormous enrichment, much more than having just, dare I say, uh, negatively a melting pot where everybody is equal and everybody has the same level in terms of economic, in terms of uh, cultural, whatever, uh, standards. I see differences as a positive thing as well, but I agree entirely with you, if the difference get too far and you cannot cooperate or not even communicate with each other anymore, then it gets difficult and it becomes a uh, problem of tensions. But uh, we have tried with what we call the cohesion funds and different regional projects already in different parts of the country, never the whole country, and always 50% subsidies only from the EU. So that means the country itself has to come in as well to motivate the people on the spot to, uh, to agree with this kind of a program to help them. So this kind of cooperation in different parts of different uh, member states has gone uh, quite far already. That's why, for instance, even in countries which have joined only recently, like Poland, Hungary, and the other Eastern European and Central European countries, they have already enormously advanced in the economic development. And uh, big European companies have invested there because the labor market is much more positive for them and other advantage you see of the differences. So I dare say, even in this context, vive la différence, there is a certain positive aspect of differences within the uh, European Union. And you see that even at global level, you know, trade is made up of differences. This uh, comparative advantage, as Ricardo calls it in economic terms, is within the EU as well. And sometimes you have even competition between different member states for certain uh, programs, which uh, helps as well to level up the uh, different uh, standards they have uh, in comparison to each other. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm very much idealistic that. about these differences. <laughs> no, I love that. And well, I was thinking mostly on the austerity policies that the yeah. EU imposed, specifically on Greece, right? It just seemed so... Um, it really hurt the country in the in the long run. And so that's where I was thinking about the, you know, equality part and how effective it has uh, been. But then I keep coming back to this 80% consensus, which is just seems unheard of. Like I can't imagine the United States <laughs> <laughs> being able to come up with an 80% consensus and get on things anything. done, right? And, and cooperate on that level. I mean, it's just, phenomenal. <laughs> no, but there is, of course, as I said, uh, dealing and wheeling beforehand. And we yes. have uh, long sessions and people realize, you know, in the end, being solidary and having a program together very often helps even the uh, minority different opinions, you know. This sense yes. is accepted sometimes, but nevertheless, they come over because they feel uh, it's part of the whole program. The bigger issue of European advance over the national limitation sometimes. It takes some convincing often, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Larry, did you have any other questions before we moved on? Uh, no, I'm very eager to know more about your thoughts on the Ukraine uh, war uh, and you know, where, where it goes relative to the uh, EU policies. Uh, that as a European, uh, yeah, ancien fonctionnaire, as we say, as a former official, I should shut up here because this is not in the 
EU competence at all. But politically, on a personal uh, standpoint, I should say, I see a certain responsibility of NATO here. And if you look into history, you mm -hmm. certainly know Professor Mersheimer, uh, who has his idea that uh, it was NATO more or less pushing Putin in a corner. So he is fighting back now. I don't agree entirely with him, but at least there is some uh, element in this discussion as well, which we have to respect that historically mm -hmm. there was a chance to get the Russians into this kind of integration process, even within Europe. And even Putin himself at the time was open enough to uh, discuss some kind of membership with the European process. But unfortunately, it didn't work out and there were some, uh, yeah, you might remember uh, your own uh, Secretary of State Baker, who seems to, at the time, have had a different opinion of his president and uh, was more in favor to help the Russians to be part of the Western uh, context here. So there mm -hmm. are different political uh, historic interpretations. In my understanding, uh, it's too late now to do that, of course. And it's always nice to, with hindsight, to criticize certain politic political issues of the past. But uh, I think we have to go back to see some kind of uh, at least communication now between both sides. And it has to involve not only uh, Russia and Ukraine, I think China as well as the US, Europe, as many as possible should be involved in finding some kind of common uh, communication at least to start with. I was recently in Indonesia just before the Bali conference of the uh, summit of the G20. And I was invited by the Indonesian government to uh, see how far the Bandung conference, you might remember of 1955 during the Cold War to find some kind of non-alignment movement could be uh, kind of revitalized. It was quite interesting. It was only a group of some 60 or so academic coming together, but nevertheless, there is already this understanding that we are again in some kind of cold war and we need to see some kind of in between, in the middle, non-alignment movement in order to bring the extremes yeah. together at one table. And I think uh, in the long run, we have to find some kind of communication. The war as such uh, will never end otherwise. And we will have some kind of Korean solution for Ukraine with Russia, which I personally would be, uh, yeah, very much. How, one one last question for me. How, uh, how so solid is the EU relative to uh, jurisdiction of the ICC? There we are fully behind it. Is we it 100%? Accept, all member states accept it. There is no issue. Okay. It is fully accepted. Not only because it's in Den Haag, it's here in the EU itself physically, but uh, the EU has no uh, dissents whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Unlike the United States. Pardon me? Who has failed to ratify the treaty. Um, no comment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think that's it for the EU part. So thank you so much. Yeah. Now, using the EU as some kind of a stepping stone beyond the nation, I use the word supranationality, which now in law is more or less established, I think. The idea that there is some kind of possibility of governance beyond the nation with particular competences, as I mentioned already, the exclusive competence of the EU. To see a little bit the various stages here beyond the nation. Of course, we still think in terms of nation with the past of the Westphalia peace process of the 17th century, the sovereignty still outside the EU. Excuse me. Hello? Okay. Sorry. I, I thought there was a question coming up. No? No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, see, the idea of sovereignty of course, with globalization, this understanding of sovereignty being absolute is, I dare say, an aberration, really, because we are not anymore in this kind of independent possibility for any, even North Korea is not 
independent in that sense, being fully sovereign. They depend, and once you have any treaty, any legal binding uh, association or what with another nation, you're already not sovereignty in this field. So that's what Hoppus, uh, Thomas Hoppus said at the very beginning already in one of his publications that uh, otherwise we had would have a completely anarchic system in the world. So globalization and particular with the media giants, we have seen already upstream some kind of loss of sovereignty, but as well downstream within most of the nations. And even in the UK, they use the term devolution there. We have this idea of subsidiarity here within the EU, that things should be done at the lowest level possible, to be as close as possible to the citizen in deciding and legisl legislating issues. This, of course, brings down the nation as its kind of absolute sovereign identity. And we see that as well with the movements towards regions. We have uh, in Asia, the mm -hmm. ASEAN, and now recently in economic terms as well, the RCEP, the CPTPP, and all these abbreviations of regional integration in economic terms as well. And of course, I mentioned already the African Union, Mercosur, and Latin America, and in North America, NAFTA, which apparently changed its name and a little bit of its contents under Trump. I don't know if Biden uses the term NAFTA now or not. There's a new name, I understand, which is the Mexican, US, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the letters have changed a little bit, but in my understanding, it has not changed anything in terms of supranationality, at least. No. So these regional organizations here are only intergovernmental. That means the national governments still have their sovereignty uh, as far as possible uh, maintained. This is different from the idea of the EU, where we have this pooling of sovereignty and supranational decision-making at European level. This is a basic difference between the uh, various integration processes worldwide. And uh, I have to say there is no precedence, actually, of peaceful integration to supranational level outside uh, Europe so far. So Europe has some kind of precedence here. And I dare call that, and that is the next step then, which I will uh, detail a little bit further. The EU as such, with this idea of supranationality, could be a stepping stone to global governance, which I then call omnilateral, going beyond the nation and opening up to other uh, factors within governance. And we need that in particular for climate and at the moment, of course, against the issue of wars as well. Next slide, please. So worldwide, the national sovereignty is still being used. And it's interesting if you look in particular cases, for instance, the issue of Palestine, the issue of Taiwan, are they nations, but they are not represented in the United Nations. So to define the nation as such is very difficult. And we see already here Thomas Hoppus in the uh, 17th century already clearly said that sovereignty in the end would lead to international anarchy because any binding obligation between nations would reduce sovereignty. And of course, we see within the EU these binding obligations and rights between the nations has developed to the farthest already with the supranationality. And here, of course, the loss of sovereignty of the nation upstream and downstream is uh, very clear. Interesting is as well, we see downstream more and more even what they call now the uh, federalization on the one hand, and as well, the search of autonomy or even independence, like in Scotland, in Catalonia, in Spain, you find that as well in Asia. Mindanao in the Philippines, for instance, is one case where they use this term of autonomy or even uh, sovereignty. And Okinawa in Japan as well seems to play a particular role within the uh, Japanese context there. So you have issues uh, of yeah, devolution of smaller identities at lower level of the nation, sub-national uh, issues coming up more and more worldwide. Next slide, please. I want to go now into actual issues which give examples where the problems with the nations are very obvious. And one 
example for me, one very evident example is the pandemic, because pandemic is a word meaning all people involved. And that's why it's different from the endemic, which is only limited to a certain group of people. Here we have the people, all peoples involved. And that's why the WHO is relevant to deal with this issue. But the problem really was that there was already some knowledge of the Corona virus in Taipei after a flight came in from Wuhan and Taipei the Taiwanese administration sent an email to the WHO in Geneva alerting them of these issues. But the WHO being part of the United Nations is not fully accredited there. They are not part of the UN system in this context, other than the WTO, for instance. So the officially, they could not accept this alarm or alert from Taipei and look into the problems there might have been already uh, some kind of investigation earlier. They could not do that because officially they were not allowed to take that in. And there was of course some influence by China in the end. And China kept this information as long as possible within their own uh, remit. If this uh, knowledge would have been uh, used by the WHO earlier to declare the pandemic, it could have actually uh, avoided millions of deaths and even trillions of euros of damage in the economy. Just one week or two weeks would have changed enormously the uh, impact of the corona we still have to live with now. And this is just because the idea of the nation, as the United Nations, the UN defines it and was more or less established then by the other members uh, being there in the United Nations, uh, did not allow Taipei to be part of the system as a nation. So the problem here is the nation. What is a nation? Only those who are part of the some 193 or so uh, members of the United Nations, or should others have as well this possibility to inform these World Health Organization and other bodies if there's a problem? I personally feel this shows that the definition we have and the limitations of the uh, definition of the uh, nation can have enormous impacts on our daily life. It's interesting if you look at the charter of the United Nations, it starts at the very beginning, we the peoples, not the nations. And I'm using this more and more now to fix not the national identity, but which people do you belong to as an identity? And this, I think, in the long term, we should be more aware of. And I go as far as even replacing the word international by creating this word, which I call interpopular. Interpeople, interpopular. It sounds much more positive anyway. And uh, I think in the long term, it might be interesting to see how far we go beyond this national limitation by using even different uh, terminologies here. And of course, I bring it in the context of what I call omnilateralism here to bring in not only nations, but other non-state and non-national stakeholders into the omnibus, into the bus we are driving here. So this is just an extreme example where I feel the nation as it is defined has enormous impact, negative impact on uh, our geopolitical problems and the situation, particular with the corona as we see it even nowadays still. Next slide, please. It's interesting that even an independent panel by the WHO itself, where China, of course, is a very influential member, has uh, shown that the pandemic as such was preventable. The pandemic as such was preventable. It could have been reduced from the beginning to an pandemic. And it was clearly said that the alert, alert system was too slow. That means the information from Wuhan to the WHO could have been done earlier and that would have avoided enormous damage, of course, as we have seen. Only one week would have made much of a difference, but this is now, of course, with hindsight, easy to say. Next slide, please. But it's not only 
the case of the worldwide information system. I want to show you here, since we are talking in the beginning about the EU, how the different levels of administration within the EU de facto can work together in a positive way. And the uh, vaccination system we had here against COVID was a clear case because we saw that at local level, of course, we needed the information to bring together to the European level. There had to be some kind of through going information system already, which in the beginning didn't work too well. And governments, of course, again, national governments had their own ideas sometimes, but it worked to the point that it, we were able at EU level to buy the vaccines for all 27 member states together. And I dare say here, being critical of Anglo-Saxon uh, way to d deal with the issues, we were the first even to export outside the EU to other third countries, uh, some of the vaccinations all the way to Japan, actually. And we, with this kind of buying vaccines, of course, we had rather fast the possibility to vaccine people, of course. And uh, I have to add here that some of the vaccines were produced even here nearby, nearby Bruxelles. So the Belgian context was very important. And of course, you might know that in Germany, some of the basic uh, innovations and the basic inventions for the vaccine was developed already. So this cooperation with, of course, Pfizer in the US as well, in the end, uh, was very important here again, the communication cooperation between and over borders. But it was here all the way down to the local level, the communication from local to, to uh, Brussels and then from uh, Brussels down to the local again, in terms of what is necessary. It was very much this idea of subsidiarity because the local officials decided about the distribution and the number of vaccines they needed. So this communication there was all of a sudden developed very fast and rather successful. I dare say I have not been wearing a mask for more than a year now here, and uh, very few cases where we have still in Europe the obligation to wear a mask. We are rather developed in that context here, thanks to the high level of vaccination. And this is, of course, just in contrast to China, where they had other means and uh, try to have this yeah, tr zero tolerance policy, which uh, at the moment seems to be uh, not very successful at all. And uh, they changed all of a sudden again for political reasons and other pressures, of course. This is just to give you an example how it can work. And this map I show here shows that the national borders actually were not al always really the borders where you could see differences on one side or on the other side of the border in terms of vaccination or in terms of impact on the uh, situation in Corona, very often there are overlapping colors over the borders. That means uh, people are still moving over borders and the borders as such make no sense actually because people have so much, communication, so much communication together. together. Pardon me? Pardon me? No. Oh, no question. Okay, sorry. Sure. Next slide, please. So this, these examples just show the idea in what I call welfare. And here in contrast with that, the idea of warfare, because even in war, we have problems now to see uh, the, the identity of the nation as such anymore. And this is the Financial Times of London criticizing the US in Afghanistan. And uh, here as well is the understanding of the nation state again a question because we westerners tend to assume that a government should be equated with a nation which of course is very much our historic experience since the peace of westphalia but nevertheless afghanistan apparently showed very clearly there's a shifting mosaic of city states and overlapping fiefdoms that is a nation state is not a very strong concept and i dare say this applies to most of Asia as such, particularly China, of course, with its very centralized position in the civilization uh, in uh, East Asia. Of course, you, can, you could use as well the idea of asymmetric wars, which 9-11 was an example of, where the nation as such is not the issue. Uh, it's really within the nation, 
you have terrorists moving anyway across borders and the border is not an absolute uh, sovereignty of the nation in that case either. Next slide, please. So welfare as welfare with a virus and the warfare, the example of Afghanistan, among others, shows that the nation is not absolutely sovereign anywhere in the world anymore. And I mentioned here in case, a North Korean case as well, North Korea is not absolutely sovereign either. They are depending on other neighboring countries, in particular China, of course, and they are part of the United Nations already. So there are already certain uh, obligations and rights vis-a-vis -vis the outside, which reduce this understanding of the sovereignty. Governance, and I've shown that uh, with the European case in particular, if it's central or federal, it acts at several levels everywhere in the world, because you have to implement your decision even from the highest national level, you have to go down into the administrative level to implement it at local level. So there are different levels. Not all levels can be equally democratic. I fully accept that. And if we have time, I can go into various levels of democracy that are appropriate in the multi-level governance system. Yeah, I just want to say that we cannot only think of the nation as being the only acting uh, level for governance. Next, please. So a comment, if I might, uh, <clears throat> just the, the notion of sovereignty in my, from my perspective, uh, sovereignty as a concept pretty much came to an end at the, at, with World War II and the, and the advent of nuclear weapons. Now that any, several nations on the planet have the ability to destroy all the other nations at will. What what does sovereignty mean in that context? Then there is no there is no ultimate sovereignty there, and 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 that also uh, nationalistic patriotism is the root cause of war almost in every case, um, where where nationalism and nationalistic nationalism uh, national popularism it's actually the driver of war. If it were not for patriotism toward a nation if it was shifted to patriotism towards the earth it would end the concept of war and then sovereignty could be revert would revert to the autonomy of the individual provided right. it was a democratic and not an aut autocratic government of the world and that's what we're aiming for is greater empowerment of the individual as autonomous in in their own sovereignty and the end of national sovereignty as an ultimate uh, platform. Uh, a question about uh, for you. What uh, maybe I should have known this prior to our to our hearing you. But uh, what, are you currently operating, uh, Doctor Papi? Are you currently occupying a a chair or a governmental seat in in, in any institution? Or wh what is your status? I'm just a pensioner. I'm very much writing in my individual capacity. I have no uh, association or representation of anybody whatsoever. Even very the good. various fellowships I did uh, are very independently as an individual, which you just said we should empower more. Mm -hmm. I fully agree with you. Yes. But to be honest, in that case, I have some kind of a problem because this understanding of universal individualism or universal rights of the individual, uh, I have to see with cultural differences in particular East Asia and US America, this individualism has some limits somewhere. And if you look into the need for governance, you have to see some kind of limits of individual freedom. There is no right without any obligation. That's what basic concept I'd learned at law school here in Europe. And uh, whatever right you claim as an individual can be an obligation to somebody else and the other way around. So there's for me some logic already in that. And just the fact that we are not nomads anymore on this planet here, we are not freely moving around. Since we had Mesopotamia starting to specialize and starting to have this agricultural development for civilization, I think we more and more have not only too many people on this planet, planet so we have to find some kind of 
uh, cooperation and coordination, where the freedom of the individual has to be limited to some degree more and more even. The more we are, the more limits we have as an individual. But it should not be just decided at the national level. And there I agree entirely with you. The indiv individual should have from the very start, and I call that uh, direct democracy at the local level, for instance, very direct uh, impact on the decision making. Whereas the higher you get, you need more and more representation. And even sometimes the representation in parliaments is not good enough, where I feel stakeholder democracy should come in. But this is a discussion that leads us a little bit further away sure. from the basic issues here. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Can I go on uh, further yeah. comment questions? Thank you. So just for the terminology, I should be clear here because I'm going a little bit into Latin here. When I talk about omnilateralism, I mentioned already it comes from omnibus, for all and all, by all. And I mean here stakeholders involved in the issues of governance beyond the nation. But we have to see how is it developed at various stages here. The relationship between nations, the so-called international relations, are ruled by one thing, unilateral uh, activities, which is very much seen in the context of uh, Donald Trump at the time, or even Bush was criticized to be too unilateral very often by Europe and some Asian powers. Of course, uh, Russia's Putin is very obviously a unilateral uh, ruler there of Russia. Then you have bilateral uh, relations that is mainly free trade agreements um, between two nations like China and Switzerland here, where you have the problem. And that again brings us to this higher level of governance that if you have only bilateral treaties and they are all different, China might have one treaty with Switzerland, but a different one with the US or, and again, a different one with Australia or so. This is called the spaghetti bowl of FTAs. That means there are so many overlapping different links, which is very difficult, particularly for the smaller and medium-sized enterprises to understand, even tariff rules and all that. So the better, uh, the higher the level, the more involved in these FTAs is the better for the world economy, actually. It's clearer, particularly for uh, smaller and medium-sized enterprises who don't have the means to understand all that and even language and other issues for them. Then there is a trilateral, which is the case of China, Japan, Korea. They have a common secretariat in Seoul now, which unfortunately is not moving very fast in uh, bringing these three uh, together. And then you have the plurilateral, which is hardly known outside the WTO. That is more than three, but not yet many like the multi. The multi, of course, is a most used term, multilateral, and this is based very much on this accepted uh, term of the nation. So the United Nations is called multilateral in this context because there are nations uh, which decide uh, at the moment in the UN General Assembly 193, for instance. And I want to go beyond that uh, bringing in not only the nations, but all other stakeholders, particularly civil society with their expertise. And that would be then omnibus for and by all uh, omnilateralism. And just to explain the word here, uh, Immanuel Kant, already the term philosopher, used the term allseitig, and that was translated into omnilateralism then. And he goes back, you might know, into the 18th century with his philosophy of enlightenment uh, at the time. Next slide, please. But we have to be aware, uh, aware of the issue that international law actually is very much seen from the Western perspective and based on the colonizing uh, powers of Europe going out into Latin America, Africa, as well as uh, Asia. And they created with Hugo Curtius at the time this understanding of international law by saying that the mare librum, that the sea is free, but once you are on land, there are certain rights which are limited. And 
that was a starting of international law that you saw certain limits, territorial limits, and which developed then into nations. Of course, you could, could criticize that China is using this kind of colonizing or newly <laughs> colonial power China uh, in Africa and other parts of the world similarly, but this is very much a political uh, stance which we could discuss later. The continents, of course, with the Western colonizers drew up the frontiers by the military very clearly. And this was in the beginning only a military line, which then with the independence of these then nations, the uh, United Nations in particular, were seen as sovereign identities. And that is the multilateral Westphalian system imposed by European understanding of the world onto the rest of the world. That is my personal interpretation of international law. Next, please. You see that very clearly here. The lines have nothing to do with any rivers or mountains or whatever natural borders. They are very much artificial frontiers in the beginning by the military, which then grew into some kind of international uh, borders under the system of international law as we know it now. And it's not only in Africa, which I show here on this map, it's the same in uh, Latin America and even some parts of Asia, you see straight lines, which have nothing to do with national uh, borders or rivers or mountains that might divide peoples from each other. Next, please. So global governance is more and more seen as being necessary, particularly with cases of the environmental issues, Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl, there are very clear cases where you saw that the borders as such uh, cannot stop the in, in, environmental impact. And uh, we see here uh, that we need global solutions because the nations cannot deal with these issues anymore. If a cloud goes, uh, with radioactive activity uh, from Chernobyl over to Western Europe. We could not do anything about it here. We just had to, had to try to avoid the rain coming down. And it was actually at the time a fact that some people were using an umbrella, just afraid of any drop coming from the clouds coming over us here in, in Europe at the time. There is, of course, informally is a group of seven and now is a group of 20 in particular, which are some kind of uh, yeah, coordinating groups of heads of government and heads of uh, state coming together. And the EU, for instance, officially is one of the members of the G20. So it's not just a national representation, but nevertheless, it's based on national membership. And uh, these groups, of seven or 20 are non-binding in their whatever pronouncement they bring out. Their declarations are more political declarations. And if you saw, for instance, in Bali last November, the declaration of the G7 summit, it's a long list, and I call it a litany of some 50 points, which sound very nice. We have to do something about the environment. We have to make sure that the financial system is stable and all these very good things. And there was in the beginning this very uh, striking point that uh, there was a declaration more or less against the war of Russia in Ukraine, but nevertheless, it was declared as most of us saw it as a, a negative development, but uh, they had to uh, acknowledge even uh, although yeah, Putin was not present, he was invited, but didn't show up, and Lavrov, his uh, foreign minister, was the only representative of Russia in the group. So uh, with them involved even, uh, there was a group clearly saying they don't want to associate with this uh, criticism of uh, the most of the group uh, against Russia. So it, it was not really a very uh, coordinated uh, declaration in that sense. But uh, nevertheless, they clearly showed some transparency of the discussion in Bali among the leaders, that there are some pro and some want to be at least abstaining from uh, criticism against Russia. So this is the informal group of seven and uh, 20 
being quite influential because of their publicity and their uh, repercussions in the press and in the uh, public opinion. And then you have, of course, as mentioned before already, the United Nations and all these international organizations like the WHO, which is very much upfront now in the news because of Corona. I mentioned already the problem of uh, information only coming in from nations being accepted. You have the WTO, and it's interesting, for instance, Taiwan is a member of the WTO, but not of the WHO. It's quite interesting to see the differences here. And then you have the World Bank, the International Labour Organization, IMF, and so on. And of course, we have now uh, very much in the headlines as well, the process of the conventions of the parties, particularly on climate change, which just uh, happened to be uh, last November in uh, Egypt and will be uh, coming up at the end of this year again. A process which I feel is very much already in the direction of omnilateralism, because you have here very much impact and influence by the civil society stakeholders. And for instance, uh, small island countries have uh, quite a bit to say in this context, although they are very small, they are still being seen as being a real stakeholder, because for them, there's more than only at stake, their survival is more or less uh, dependent on what we do about the climate here. Next, please. <clears throat> this is just to show a little bit, to visualize that uh, there's a puzzle of nations. If you put together all the 193 uh, nations in similar sizes on this kind of presentation of the continents, you would have a very strange co colorful picture here, which uh, would give this kind of equality as it is uh, one nation, one vote in the General Assembly of the United Nations. But de facto, of course, you have not only the Security Council with the five permanent members, which have much more of an impact, it's uh, even economically and in terms of population, enormous differences here. I mentioned already the very small island uh, countries, island nations, the Pacific have had a particular stake in climate change, for instance, which would not be reflected at all in this context. Next, please. And this is the reality of physical size, at least. If you compare again, the representativity of the uh, various nations in the UN, it's bewildering uh, the big and small. China has about 145,000 times the population of the smallest nations, which is Nauru in the Pacific. But both have one seat in the United Nations General Assembly. This is the principle of one nation, one vote. And I don't think this is correct. I said there might be on certain issues like the uh, climate change, much more an issue for Nauru, for instance, a very small nation in the Pacific, than for Austria, which is much bigger and has politically much more of an influence because Austria is in the Alps, is very much protected against climate change in certain ways, at least from rising water of the uh, oceans. But these different stakes have to be reflected somewhere in the uh, decision making of the United Nations, to my view. But this is not possible if you have one seat for every so called nation in the United Nations General Assembly. And this picture here with a little boy bewildered by the various uh, sizes of countries on the map shows that clearly. Next, please. <clears throat> Even the UN Secretary General Guterres clearly, clearly said that he needs more involvement even in the decision-making of the United Nations. <clears throat> this is quite striking, actually, because he should know, and for him, of course, it would be much easier just to deal with the uh, 193 uh, national diplomats to find a kind of quantitative decision by a majority. But he clearly says that civil society would be much more contributing and should be really part of the decision making. That's very striking to me that he goes as far as that at the moment, they are not part of decision making. They are only helping to shape the decision in the process like lobbyists when they go to uh, to Egypt for the last COP or 
Glasgow before that. And it's interesting to see that even some nations now, 50 of them, are following this uh, unmute or UN mute initiative to have more representation of the uh, NGOs, which are already in one way or the other accredited to the United Nations and the so-called ECOSOC. And they want more participation in the UN by these uh, NGOs because they work actually transporter and they are much more involved in uh, these global issues than some of the uh, diplomats, they, which are part of the de final decision making in the UN. Next, please. <clears throat> so we see here that this problem of one nation, one vote, actually is what we call the quantitative system legitimacy. It goes back to the basic formal formula of the uh, democracy understanding, one person, one vote. And I wonder how far this kind of quantitative uh, understanding of democracy is really in the long term the only way to get to better uh, governance at global level. That's why I bring in here this un understanding of the performance legitimacy. That means the quality, qualitative experts uh, should be more involved in the decision making and bringing in voices and not only votes, the quantity. Of course, you can go back already into American history with uh, Alexis de Tocqueville in the 19th century saying that there's a danger, a risk of tyranny of the majority in the US. I don't want to compare that to the situation nowadays if there is a danger as such, but I dare say, and there I'm very critical not only of the US system, but as well in France, for instance, there's presidential systems with this more or less direct voting for the highest post in the country. That means a head of state and head of government is coming together in the presidential system is a rather delicate and sometimes risky fashion to find a solution for democratic uh, methods. And I mentioned here, of course, uh, Trump as well as Putin, Erdogan, in the Philippines until recently it was Duterte and maybe in the future there is a danger in France of Le Pen becoming president. But I wonder how far you need at least this kind of representation of parliament as some kind of surveillance permanent uh, control over the presidential system. Of course you have Congress in the US and you have parliament in France and even in the Philippines there is some kind of parliamentary uh, control, but nevertheless, the presidential system allows the first person, first man or woman in the country to say they have direct mandate from the people, which is, uh, in my understanding, a very delicate uh, thing to do, particularly in big countries where the uh, distance from the president to the uh, people is rather uh, far away. So the direct understanding of who he or she is as a president is not always given and we depend very much anyway on the media for this understanding of politics. Of course, there is as well now with the artificial intelligence, the possibility of crowd voting, but I doubt very much if this kind of crowd voting would allow better performance in governments and public affairs. Uh, the majority is not always and there I'm very elitist, maybe uh, the best informed uh, part of our uh, society to decide really about the public interest and the things to be decided in governance. So this is maybe you could see me as some kind of undemocratic uh, authoritarian elitist, but uh, from my experience, at least in different countries, I see an issue here with this kind of crowd voting. Uh, if you, for instance, do a crowd voting now on climate change all over the world, well, I think that we would have a positive decision in this context. I personally feel in the long term, we need some kind of consensus building. The higher you are in multi-level governance from local to global, the more you need consensus building and we cannot uh, avoid different opinions and we have to bring in as much as possible all the different expertise 
stakeholders and uh, civil society in particular. That's why I mentioned already before, you know, a certain way surprising you that the European Council decides with 80% uh, consensus building. This is what I feel uh, closer to this kind of qualitative convincing voices instead of only quantitative uh, voting with majorities. Next, please. So global decisions uh, are done by votes quantitatively. And it's interesting uh, to quote here Greta Thunberg of Fridays for Future. You might know her as well. She is uh, at least a representative of the young generation, although she is getting older herself as well. I think she's not a teenager even right now anymore. But uh, nevertheless, she got this uh, kind of motto, this kind of slogan out, there is no planet B for us. And it's quite interesting if you compare it, for instance, uh, with the idea of governance by democracy, we have at the level of uh, local democracy the possibility to move out into a village B if you are in a minority. But at global level, you have no, at least now, still no way to move out into planet B. There is no alternative for us human beings here. We are still earthlings limited to this earth. And uh, that's why we need to go beyond just majority voting and try to find as far as possible a consensus of all to represent uh, our understanding of democracy and not only uh, one person, one vote or crowdsourcing. And here I have to mention as well the problem we face with our information society that we depend enormously on these uh, new technology, uh, internet, and the GAFAM and BATX uh, media giants of China and of America, dare I say, simplifying it. They are ruling the world, actually. And these very often go back to individuals deciding, for instance, if a president has access to an information system or not. I don't think this is part of a democratic society. Next, please. Just to sum it up a little bit here, uh, so the legitimate democracy should be by people's participation, not necessarily by election or quantitative voting, but uh, it could be as well by voices coming together. If you remember the original understanding of democracy in Athens, for instance, the Agora, there were lots of voices and even voices changed very often. People were coming and going into this kind of public space at the time. So it was not decided by votes at the time, uh, majority or minority. It was a very long deliberative pro process very often. And I think we can have this kind of direct democracy at local level, because people know what their interests are. People are directly informed. They even might know the mayor of the village uh, to decide if there should be a pool or theater in the neighborhood, for instance. You can have really one person, one vote to decide things without a problem. And if you are outvoted, you go to village B, as I mentioned just. But the higher you get already at provincial and national level, you need more and more some kind of not only representation, but some kind of permanent uh, surveillance of the decision making. And this is very difficult to do. We have now, of course, in most countries, parliaments uh, doing this job, but even parliaments uh, in Europe are more and more criticized because they are too far away. On top of it, with the party politics, you have uh, enormous polarization very often, uh, ideology uh, orientation only, and issues are very rarely taken up as such. And I dare say, uh, particularly the movement of green parties in Europe has shown for the first time that at the beginning, at least, of these green parties, they are focusing very much on issues and not on ideology. This, unfortunately, now is changing already once I in power they are moving in one or the other direction here as well. But uh, this at the moment is only played out at national level in particular these issues. And I mention here, uh, as you see there at national level, Brexit and Donald Trump as the extreme cases of majority voting, which is not really uh, 
giving the best for the country in the long term. Regional issues, uh, here you have some kind of parliamentary representation already. Uh, I mentioned the European Parliament as well. There are lots of criticism against the Parliament because they are too far away. Bureaucracy and all that, the problems of communication, different languages, 24 officially, and all these issues. So the parliamentary system at regional level already is very much criticized. And we have just recently uh, started a new discussion about the treaty changes possibly in the future of the EU democratic system. But uh, this is very difficult to do because you need, at least for treaty changes, you need always a full uh, consensus of member states. And at the moment, particularly with uh, Hungary and Poland, this is not easy to do. So this next step is global governance. And here I feel the least direct participation is possible because of the comprehensiveness of the issues. It's so large to talk about climate change, for instance, that the average voter, the average uh, democratic uh, representative very often cannot follow all the issues. So we need more and more expertise, technocracy in this context. And then the uh, issue here of the increasing market of media, the dependence of information on issues of global concern is so high that uh, the individual cannot at all uh, really deal with these issues. You need organizations like NGOs who are uh, representing certain knowledge and are hopefully science-based as stakeholders with their voices. And here I see again the movement of the COP, uh, COP21 in particular, uh, showing that we go beyond the uh, voting only if these expertise come in with, with more influence and could help to avoid the problems of climate change in particular. Next, please. This is a little bit uh, abstract here. The uh, various problems we had at multilateral level of global governance with the national uh, decision-making process here. And I uh, contrast here the COP in Copenhagen where China and the US together more or less uh, finally brought down a, de a clear decision in favor of climate uh, protection in contrast to Paris where for the first time enormous influence by stakeholders, by uh, civil society helped to bring the national diplomats to some kind of uh, consensus and uh, voting in favor of uh, positive declaration to help the climate. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is with this uh, voting system, you are much closer to a short term decision making. And we have very uh, few instruments for comprehensive visions uh, to uh, contribute to the crisis of legitimacy of the institutions as such. Uh, it's interesting to see particular the case of the Battle of Seattle. I don't know if you remember that some uh, 25 years almost ago, when the WTO in Seattle could not continue anymore because the NGOs and the people in the street, the demonstrators stopped them from moving into the uh, conference center from the hotels. And it was really a battle in the streets. I think we should be able to bring in these people who have something to say on the issues into the conference room as stakeholders and not uh, fight it out in the streets. And that is what I call the NGO voices in contrast to the WTO votes, where, of course, the national representatives came together only. Next, please. So we see with the COP movement in particular in Glasgow, some kind of massive movement towards this kind of governance in omnibus fair. We have had more or less 12,000 outside voices, that is, other than the diplomats, 190 who decided in the end, from various NGOs, from uh, all kinds of non-national organizations. And they, for me, represent much more what the United Nations Charter calls we the peoples, because it's in favor of public good and not only national good uh, at global level with their expertise that they can't, can't of uh, influence 
with their votes to go beyond the uh, just very unequal votes of the United Nations. So this is a new trend and uh, I dare use even the word omnibus here in understanding uh, what stakeholders are for. Uh, of course, a bus is limited, uh, it cannot take in anybody and the Airbus might be even more expensive, but they have the same origin of the word. So the voices are important and not the votes of the nations. Next, please. Well, um, sorry, Dr. Pape, um, we're coming to almost 11 o'clock. Um, oh, so I just wanted to be mindful of our time um, yes. and I, also yeah, have room to, for, uh, yeah. yeah, have room for questions. Is there any, yep. like one slide I should jump to for kind of like a- um, Just with the last slide there. The very it's last like, one? 43, 43? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, okay. So just to thank you, and if anybody is interested to send me an email, I'm uh, obviously ready to send out my book digitally to anybody who is interested. So this should go as a message uh, if there's interest in more details on the idea of omnilateralism. Thank you for your attention so far, at least. Thank you so much. I, um, I actually have a couple questions regarding the United Nations for you, Larry or Matt, did you wanna jump in ahead of me? No. Go so, you know, given that the United Nations is A, not democratic and B, not inclusive, and we don't really have this global governance mechanism yet, like where, where do you see the future of the United Nations? Do you see us being able to reform it so it is more um, inclusive and dealing with omnilateralism? Do we start over? Just wondering your thoughts on, on the UN. Uh, thank you, Vitz. This is a very far-reaching question. There is uh, recently a publication of the World Federalists uh, saying that they are working on having this kind of what they call a world parliament and then world governance in order to find some kind of uh, not only a reform process, you might know that the Charter of the United Nations in Article 109 allows a possibility. It was actually already after five years after San Francisco, that there should have been a kind of review of the charter, which never happened actually. And say the World Federalists go back now to use this article and saying it should be at least a review, but they want to go beyond only reviewing and reforming. They want to change uh, drastically, having more democratic through going representation of parliamentarians and all that. I have some doubts in this context. That's why I, Focus much more on the what I call the stakeholder democracy, which is called by some uh, monetary, not monetary, but monetary democracy. That means the governments should not only be permanently controlled or surveyed by the uh, parliaments or the politicians, but by NGOs, by civil society. And we need some kind of organizational means to find an accreditation process for the various NGOs in different sectors of uh, specialization. For instance, on climate, it could be a particular NGO which would not have anything to say on other issues like war and peace. And so you need specialization in this accreditation, which is not the case. Neither in Europe, we have a similar consultation process. I mentioned already the uh, European uh, ECOSOC kind of body. Uh, here as well, they all come together, re representatives of uh, religions as well of the employers and uh, trade unions. You need more specialization here for the stakeholder democracy. And I think this the key issue here is how to give them accreditation to be accepted as an NGO for this process of decision making in the various disciplines. And I think there we have to work much closer together with academics and uh, knowledgeable people to be involved there. And that's as well, Secretary General Guterres saying, they want to have more of this expertise and the uh, stakeholders involved in the decision-making as such, but you need to decide who is able to come in and who not. And this is very difficult to do. I, 
we had this process here in Europe as well. And we tried once when we invited different people to represent NGOs. It's very difficult to select them, to look into their own organization, if they are democratic enough, if they are accountable, uh, their responsibilities, their financial background, and all these things. They have to be very transparent to be in the system here. Agreed. And they have, I mean, the Secretary General's got the Summit of the Future to do just this, and it was supposed to be next this year, actually, and he's already delayed it again to 2024. Yes. Um, so we, I, you know, CGS is actually involved in that in, yeah. in, a, in a little bit, but we'll see how that unfolds, where all of these NGOs from yeah. all over the globe can actually make recommendations and then have the UN... Um, actually adopt those but you know it this is a slow incremental these are slow incremental reforms these aren't the the kind of um kind of drastic things that you know that's really needed that especially involving omnilateralism that certainly is true and the problem here is of course nobody who is in a position of power like the nations are now in the un will give up power in order to have others come in that's why I'm, I was so impressed by these uh, national representative being part of this unmute or UN mute initiative to have NGOs more involved. That surprised me very much because there are apparently 50 nations interested in helping the others. But I'm quite sure these are very small nations who feel that the NGOs would help their problems, like the island states in the Pacific, for instance. It's not the uh, US or Russia or the EU, for instance, I'm sure. Exactly. <laughs> um, Matt or Larry, did you have any final questions? Nope. I'm... Well, I'll, I'll just, uh, a broad question. What do you see, say, over the next 20 or 30 years uh, for the evolution of the European Union, not only in terms of new members, but also in terms of the evolution of uh, the system itself and the structure itself? Do you have any thoughts on where things are going in the next 20 or 30 years? Uh, by experience, over the last 70 years, we saw that the EU, and that is a little bit what we call the Monet method, you know, Jean Monet, who was one of the founding fathers, said the EU is developing with crises. In every crisis we see, the EU was strengthened, almost all crises, whatever we face the crisis. And this seems to be the way forward. We, from the very beginning, and this again is Robert Schumann as well as Monet, they clearly said there is no kind of blueprint for the future. The EU is very much uh, developing step by step with the circumstances in the world. And this, I think, will continue. I personally feel, of course, that we are strengthening ourselves and uh, there's more and more input uh, beyond the traditional democratic system. And I feel here the criticism, for instance, of the European Parliament. And I dare say that sounds again very arrogant, probably. They need much more information, much better uh, possibilities of research and input from academics and outside their parliamentary system in order to really uh, be able to judge the issues at hand. The Commission and other more executive bodies of the EU have much more at hand, much more possibilities to uh, get the right information. And it's difficult because the EP is directly elected, for instance. They are part of the people representation, the most effective they should be. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. And dare I say in national congresses, national parliaments, this is similar as well. The executive is so overburdening particularly in Japan, which I know a little bit because I lived there and studied there already uh, for almost 15 years. There as well, it is very much the executive, the government that is dealing with the issues and the control by parliament is very limited. So the EU should find some, dare I say, more omnilateral understanding of the democracy at that level and not just have this kind of formal understanding of parliament and then uh, decide uh, through the commission as the executive. Thank you.
I don't think I had any other questions. I'm just taking all of this in. Um, you've given me a lot of thought regarding the EU yeah. and is, it, you know, we all kind of hold that up as this ideal model. Um, <laughs> and I think we need to ask ourselves some more questions on that, right? And um, so I really appreciate all this time that you've given us. Thank you well, so thank much, you. Dr. Papa. Thank you very much. <laughs> very enlightening. In particular, very, very lots to think about. Yes, please let me know of your thoughts. I'm looking forward. That's why I put down my email here. Let's keep in contact. All right. I'm a lifelong student of yours. Thank you. And we will do. Um, here, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and let me um, stop the recording. Um, hold on. I've got a couple of different screens here. I'm trying to.